Hey, my name is Matt Storr and I repair saxophones for a living. And today I would like to talk to you in a concise version uh, about the King Super 20 saxophone. So I made a, another video, it was actually the first video I'd made after a long uh, period of not making videos. And I think it ended up being basically a sprawling mess that probably hardly anybody's going to be interested in uh, looking at. But I'm going to go ahead and publish it anyways under, uh, you know, with that caveat, I'll probably call it the crappy version or something like that. And this will be the hopefully 10 minute long version that's much more informative and interesting. Um, so I'm going to keep it simple and try and keep it uh, concise. So the King Super 20 saxophone. Uh, was made by H.N. White in Cleveland, Ohio, and then for a period of time was actually made in East Lake, Ohio. And the saxophone was made over a very long period of time, from about 1945 until 1967 in Cleveland, and from 1967 to 1998 in East Lake. And the one we're looking at here is known as a Series 2, and you can see uh, that it's got the full pearls, it's got pearl inlay on all the extra keys. Um, and it also has a sterling silver neck. Now the one feature it doesn't have is the sterling silver bell, which was known as the Silver Sonic. Um, but other than being really cool, in my experience that doesn't seem to make a huge difference. Um, the Silver Sonic option was actually um, only on the Series 1A and later instruments, so they tend to be um, on instruments that people consider brighter, so a lot of times people say that that bell makes it brighter, but King themselves had an actual, an old ad that said it described it as being darker and more resonant. So King thought it would make it darker, people today seem to say that it makes it brighter. So I think the jury is still out, and basically however you feel about it is really what matters um, versus what other people say. So the King Super 20 is a professional saxophone made by King, which means it has the brazed tone holes. If you look at those tone holes there, you can see they're not pulled from the body. They're actually separate pieces of brass that are brazed, silver soldered, hard soldered onto the body. And that is actually a really nice thing. Um, it gives you a nice thick tone hole wall for your uh, pad seats, making it a lot easier to do really nice, firm, long-lasting pads, um, and it's actually also very difficult to damage. Um, and it, with Martins, the other saxophone that has soldered tone holes, they're soft soldered, and that tends to break down over time, and you might have to re-solder them. I have never seen that actually be a problem with Kings. Um, if you wanted to unsolder a King tone hole, you could do so, but since it is silver solder or brazing, it means you need to get the area red hot, which means you would need to remove everything around it, like posts that would be soft soldered before you did it, and of course the lacquer in that area would be completely toasted. But I've never really heard of anybody needing to do that. Even when there's major dents in a tone hole, brazing is such a strong seam, uh, it basically blends the two metals together that you can do dent work as normal, with the exception that the tone holes are quite a bit thicker than you might find on a drawn tone hole horn. Uh, and if you want to know more about the difference between drawn tone holes and soldered tone holes, you can check out the, I think it's part one of my tone hole leveling series. I talk a bit about that and show some examples. Um, so the King Super 20, as far as the sound of the Super 20 changes over time because you're talking about a horn that was made for a very, very long period of time and the sound changed with the conception of sound of the players. So the earlier ones tend to be darker uh, and a bit, um, I would say, you know, maybe richer uh, in tone, a bit, a bit fatter tone when the, uh, the, as you go on, they tend to get brighter and perhaps a bit more spread. Um, if you'd like to hear a Super 20, uh, famously Charlie Parker played one as well as Cannonball Adderley, and I think Cannonball sound in particular is a pretty good indicator of what a King Super 20 alto can sound like, especially the earlier ones. Now speaking of different vintages, um, this one here is 338,000. Uh, this would be one of the last available with the Pearl side keys. Um, and this is a really, really nice example of this instrument. It plays quite well. Uh, the ones that are the most desirable are usually the, let's say, up to around serial number 380,000. 
And then between 380,000 and 425,000, they're still being made in Cleveland, but they've started to lose some features like this double socket neck. Now the double socket neck is a lot like what you see on cons, um, and it functions much the same way. The actual airtight surface is between the exterior of the inner sleeve here and the interior of the tenon sleeve here. So if you need to do any, if you need to get this airtight, you're going to be expanding this inner sleeve and then lapping that in. However, unlike cons, this inner sleeve here and this outer sleeve here are actually separate parts from the uh, mouth pipe tube. So if you need to, you can unsolder this and unsolder this to work on it. Um, obviously, that's less desirable than being able to do it in place so you don't burn any lacquer. And by the way, there was lacquer originally on the silver necks. You can see a little bit of it left over here. You don't often see it. If you do, um, either the horn has been relacquered or it hasn't been played a whole lot. And speaking of relacquerings, this is one of those horns that I would recommend trying to stick with an original finish horn. Um, the key work is rather complex and uh, lots of it is made of nickel, which makes it a lot harder to do mechanical work too because nickel is a harder metal. So if you can avoid one that has been really beat up or has had uh, important bearing surfaces abraded by the relacquering process, by the buffing process part of the relacquering, uh, then that's what I would recommend because it can be very difficult to get these as tight as they should be uh, after they've become worn. Um, they don't typically wear too much under playing pressure, but they do get worn from relacquerings or if there's been major body damage. Um, and speaking of body damage, um, this brace is pretty strong and you don't typically see as many uh, bent bodies as you do on other models, which is really nice. Um, the only things that can be problematic other than just the general hardness of the keywork is sterling silver, which is what uh, some of the necks are made of and some of the bells are made of, is a bit more difficult to do good dent work on than brass. It's not quite as springy, it's a little more brittle. Um, and doesn't like to just pop back into place quite as easily as brass. Now I did a bunch of dent work on this neck here. This is an overhaul I completed a while ago. Hopefully you can't see it too much, um, but it is there and that was that's always just difficult to do. So if you've got a whole bunch of uh, dents or maybe even a pull down on the neck, uh, something to be aware of is that getting that dent work done as well as you might see it done on brass can be difficult. Um, but the good thing is you don't see too many pull downs on the alto necks in particular, on the tenor necks sometimes, but they seem to have a really strong brace here and here. I mean, they're basically double braced, uh, so you don't see pull downs quite so much. Usually if there's actually the force that would have been applied to be a pull down actually gets turns into damage in the double socket neck, um, which like I said, if you need to, you can unsolder these bits and get that taken care of. You can even machine a new inner sleeve here without too much difficulty if you have to. Um, now as far as the double socket neck on the earlier ones you'll see a serial number. The double socket neck eventually disappears. Uh, the ones with the double socket neck are usually more desirable. These pearl inlay keys, I've actually got a video on um, what they look like if you remove them. I do not recommend removing them. Really you shouldn't. The only reason I removed them for that video was because it was a horn I owned and it was extremely clean so I knew that it would work. And even if it didn't, it was my own saxophone so it would have been my fault. But leave these on, especially be careful of them if they look kind of like layered. The grain on these goes across, right? And if they ever get refinished or if there's been damage or if it's been dipped in acid too much, you'll start to be able to see grain in these and they start to flake off. Um, and the way they're mounted is by a screw that's actually threaded through here. Um, the mechanism, as far as the stacks go, mostly stays the same. Uh, over time, they did do a lot of changes to the left-hand pinky table. And from a playing perspective, you can see that this looks like a fairly modern left-hand pinky table. I mean, as far as the shapes go and everything. But the way it's put together is really weird. You've got this really long rod going down here where that you've got your uh, B on, that you've got your C sharp on, and also your G sharp on. And if this gets damaged, that's a real pain to get fixed, especially when you're talking about a really long hinge tube like that. And it's a really complex key with all these little bits and bobs hanging off of it. It looks like it was really complex to make and it can be complex to fix. Um, once they hit this shape, you know, the sort of modern left-hand pinky table shape, 
this shape doesn't change a whole lot, um, but the mechanism that underlies it does. And the left-hand pinky table mechanism on Super 20s um, doesn't, it really what doesn't seem well thought out. As they go along, you can see from a repairman's perspective, they're basically grafting on a modern design onto their old horn without changing much else about it. Um, and there are several iterations of this left-hand pinky table which can be very difficult to work on, especially if they've been damaged in the past. And there's one version on Tenor that is extra especially bad, probably the worst left-hand pinky table design ever, really, um, maybe outside of the Bundy 2. But you've got a really long piece here on the Tenor that actually has two different hinge rods coming in from either side that end in a pivot, and then there's a solid rod between them. So you've got, <laughs> you've got two separate hinge rods on four different posts with a pivot in the middle, and you've got one long piece that rides on both hinge rods. If it sounds really difficult to describe, it's because it's difficult to even imagine or work on. Another overly complex part of the Super 20 is the octave mechanism. And it's so complex and so strange, I actually made a video just for that. So if you're looking for the King Super 20 octave mechanism and how to work with that, please check out my standalone video on the King Super 20 octave mechanism. Once you know how to work it, it can be made to function correctly fairly, I wouldn't say easily, but it's fairly straightforward and you can get it done. And it can be nice, it can be, you know, without any play in the mechanism, it can work very, very well, um, and it can be nice and silent. But unless you spend a good bit of time on it, it's probably going to end up being extremely sloppy. And this has the potential to be one of the sloppiest octave mechanisms ever made. But if you, like I said, if you get it in good shape, it works really, really well, and it's very reliable and stable. Um, let's see. Now, the kind of pads you're gonna to wanna to use in a Super 20 are typically, I think, thin pads. Um, that's the way they came from the factory, and unless, they've, unless the pad geometry has been altered, right, like say here's your tone hole, and here's your pad cup, uh, the distance between the two when they're parallel should be filled up by your pad plus your adhesive, right? So, if you try to put too thick of a pad in, it's going to hit in the back first, and people will try and bend the key cup around. Um, and the way King key, key Cups are built with that um, sort of dome shape to them and the uh, key spine doesn't go all the way over the cup, usually instead of actually completely changing the attitude of the cup, usually what they're doing is just bending the key cup. So you might find a lot of damaged key cups on this if someone's tried to put thick pads in it before. Um, so my recommendation would be to stick with thin pads or if it's had thick pads put it in the past, fix that, fix that geometry, and get it back down to thin pads. And when I say thin pads, I mean 0.160. Um, and you'll also benefit from a lot of modern materials, um, like Teflon laminated uh, synthetic cork can be a help, um, and like modern stuff for the side keys, like uh, I use synthetic felt, you can see here on those little side key arms. Um, just helps have it have a much more positive feel uh, than if you're just sticking to cork and felt. The key guard down here, the E-flat key guard, uh, can get damaged pretty easily. If you ever have to ship one of these, take this key guard off uh, and just put a piece of padding there and put the key guard like in a baggie in the case. But if you're ever shipping this or traveling with it, it's a pretty good idea to actually take this key guard off because it always gets crushed in, especially if it's in the original case. Um, Oh, the adjustable pivot screws. Okay, so this horn has adjustable pivot screws, and I'm not sure if you can see this here, but this is a pivot screw key, which means you've got a tapered screw that fits in the end here, and you've got an, uh, the same thing on the other end, and that's what holds it on rather than a hinge tube. And these are headless pivot screws that are infinitely adjustable, basically, and then you've got a locking screw, or a locking, uh, sorry, locking nut on top that controls how far it goes in. Um, and you can buy replacements for these, and they're fairly easy to use. Just don't chew these up by using an inappropriate tool. I have a very, very tiny adjustable wrench that I use for these. If you're using regular pliers on these that aren't parallel, you'll chew these up and make it much more difficult for the person working on it next. Um, let's see. I think that's about it for the concise edition of the King Super 20. Um, much like the Mark VI, there are many, 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 many variations on the Super 20. 
and the values can vary considerably from one to the next. Um, there are versions of the Super 20 where it's got all the bells and whistles that can easily be over $10,000. And there are versions of the Super 20 particularly going on towards the last serial numbers, which, like I said, people don't realize it, but they actually made these up until the 90s. Um, you know, if you're getting up in the 700,000, 800,000 uh, serial range, I honestly wouldn't buy one. I mean, if someone gave me one, I'd probably give it, a, uh, give it away. Um, so, and, but there are some of them that are, you know, the earlier ones in particular are some of the best instruments ever made. Uh, my favorite alto is probably the Zephyr Special, which is almost identical to the first series of the Super 20. Um, they just have such a powerful, warm, and lush sound, and the tenors are just so big. They just have such a huge sound. Um, they've got a sort of a con bigness to them, um, but they're not quite as spread, and they're a little bit easier on the fingers. Oh, as far as intonation goes, um, they're pretty darn good. Uh, they're very mouthpiece friendly. I don't think I've really heard of anybody having trouble either with intonation or with ergonomics. It's a thoroughly modern horn with the exception of the very first series, which has the same left-hand pinky table as the, as the Zephyr Special. Um, and like I said, from a playing perspective, this left-hand pinky table is not problematic as long as it's set up correctly. But um, you can expect to have your repairmen complain a lot if they have to you know, fix major damage in here, especially regarding um, you know, if you've got lost motion or play in the keys, because fitting these keys down here is a real pain in the butt. It just takes a while. So don't be surprised if you take one of these in and it's in similar condition to another horn, say a Mark VI, but the King Super 20 overhaul costs you a bit more. It just takes longer, just because of how it's made and what it's made of, um, as far as the keys go. But there you have it. That's the King Super 20, one of my favorite saxophones. I love working on them. I'm very lucky to see quite a few of them. And if you would like to check out the sprawling mess that is my other video I made for these, uh, you can see quite a few different examples, um, and you can hear me drone on and on and on and on. Although there is one very special thing I show in the other video towards the end. I show Charlie Ventura's gold-plated uh, Super 20 Full Pearls Silver Sonic tenor, which is a real treat. So anyways, uh, my name is Matt Storr. I repair saxophones for a living. I hope you found this helpful, useful, informative. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, feel free to get in touch uh, you can leave a comment here on YouTube. You can get in touch with me through my website where I've got my email and my phone number listed. I do actually pick up the phone during business hours uh, during the week. So if you've got a saxophone question, feel free. Thanks for watching.